Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And we're here with another broadcast in our series we call Conservationists in Action. Rarely have we had a visitor who so lives up to that title. <laughs> Jeff Ryan, uh, author and photographer who's gonna join us here, uh, has been very much in action, hiking thousands of miles and writing very evocatively about it. Um, before we talk a little about Jeff's book, so let me give you a little background on him. Jeff is based in Maine. He's a photographer, a speaker, and a very well-traveled uh, author. He has a contagious passion for exploring the outdoors, particularly on foot and hiking boots. He's hiked literally thousands of miles, including his first trip of a lifetime, a six-month hike on the Pacific Crest Trail. In 1985, Jeff began a section hiding the Appalachian Trail with his childhood friend, a journey that actually took 28 years. And we'll talk a little about that in just a minute. It culminated in his first book, Appalachian Odyssey, a 28-year hike on America's trail. As he was writing this book, he became intrigued by the question of how the legendary trail came into being. And that led to his second book, Blazing Ahead, Benton Mackay, Myron Avery, and the rivalry that built the Appalachian Trail. In 2018, Ryan published his account of climbing Mount St. Helens in both 1987 and then 2017. And his most recent book is entitled Blast, My Return to Mount St. Helens. Ryan spends most of his time researching, writing, speaking, signing books, and exploring the back roads of the U.S. and Canada in his vintage 1985 VW camper. We're lucky to get him here for this week. We very much appreciate you taking a little time out of your research out here, Jeff. Um, to talk about your book. So thanks, thanks for coming. For, thanks for having me, Mark. I'd like to talk first about Appalachian Odyssey, a book I very much enjoyed. I read it last week. And uh, the obvious question is, why did it take you 28 years <laughs> <laughs> to hike this? I, I hear people do it in a season. <laughs> yeah, it, as little as 47 days, I think, uh, the ultra marathoners. But we started by accident. Um, I met a guy, I went on one hike with him, and uh, he called me up afterwards and said what a great time we had and uh, I agreed and he said let's go over and start doing the long trail which is the length of Vermont. It goes from the Massachusetts Vermont border all the way to Canada. It's about 280 miles and so he'd come up from Hartford, Connecticut and I'd come over from Maine mm -hmm. and we'd meet and do sections of that and one night about four years into this in the tent he said you do realize we've started the Appalachian Trail. And uh, my reaction was I burst out laughing and said, you have to be kidding. It'll take us 30 years. And his famous two-word reply was, so what? And uh, <laughs> you we, beat that we, record. we did it. We beat the record. <laughs> so every year we, uh, as he called it, we smorgasbordered the trail. Which piece do you want to do next year? Let's do part of Pennsylvania. Let's do part of New York. Um, and uh, a lot of times let's do part of Virginia because it's a quarter of the trail. So uh, that's how it all played out. That raises a logistical question. How did you keep track of all the sections you did? Did well, you have a big map you highlighted or something? Yeah, I did. I did pretty much. And um, Wayne, my friend Wayne Sear is very analytical and he was on top <laughs> of every step of the way. So where we got on and where we got off. So. Every year we'd try to figure out how much time we had and what made sense in terms of going where and then we just kept on going. Did you have a favorite part of the trail? Boy, like your that's, favorite child. Yeah, that's, it's sort of one of those. <laughs> um, I, I do have to uh, give props for southwestern Virginia. Um, mm -hmm. The reason for that is it's not within uh, a, a big metropolitan area's reach so you don't get the pressure that other parts of the trail get, uh, particularly way down in the southern end where a lot of people are, have uh, illusions of doing the trail and get on it and find out it's a little bit harder than a walk in the woods and um, they get off. So it's a beautiful part of the trail. What's the hardest part of the trail for you? The I'm hardest guessing. part, well, there are two of them. Uh, New England's pretty rugged because it's up and down yeah. and. Back in the days when most of that trail was constructed, it was, hey, look, there's the top of a mountain. Let's go the <laughs> shortest way to the top, which was usually an uh, old rock slide or a, a riverbed. But um, actually, for us, the Smokies were the toughest. We waited till 
almost the end, so we were into our 50s, and uh, we were still schlepping a 50-pound pack, and uh, the ultralight movement didn't get to us in time. <laughs> <laughs> That's because you were in your 50s. That's You're right. resistant to that. Right. <laughs> Another part of your subtitle is America's Trail, and you've hiked other places, Pacific Crest Trail and so on. Why, why is the AT America's Trail? Well, it's America's Trail because it was really the first super hiking trail. It was the first multi-state trail, um, and it's also within reach of, as I mentioned before, of a lot of people, and the familiarity is there. Geographically, it's close to a lot of people, and psychologically, I think, a lot of people grew up with the AT in their midst. So they know of it, and they've been there, and um, it's very... It's very famous, um, not just in the U.S. When you're out hiking, you can meet people from all over the world on the AT. Cool. We also listed you as a photographer, and this book is proof of it. It's profusely illustrated. And um, as a photographer, what type of shots were you looking for? I mean, you got 2,000 miles to choose from. Right. You, you, you could, you know take a picture of a million trees or, or wildlife? How did you pick what you shot? Well, it's funny. Um, when I was doing the Pacific Crest Trail, it was back in the age before digital. Mm -hmm. And so it taught me to be very picky with the shots that I took because I had a finite amount of film. And I think that was a really great lesson for me because it really taught me to see with a photographer's eyes. I can't just go out and blast or, or couldn't go out and blast a ton of shots and hope that one of them was a keeper. I really had to try to make sure every shot was a keeper. And that was really valuable to me going forward. So when digital came on, I really had a bit of a photographer's eye because of that. And um, that's what helped me. And I tried to choose, um, certainly there are a lot of opportunities for panoramic shots. Um, and it could be an entire book of panoramics. Yeah. But I also tried to make them fit with the, the narrative of the trail, which was there are man-made um, parts of the trail, parts of the trail that are very much influenced by man, both when the trail was first built and then after the fact. So I tried to weave some of that in there and not pretend that those influences aren't there. What were some of the more striking man-made influences you well, came across? Well, Skyline Drive is one of them. <laughs> we'll talk about that uh, probably when we talk about yes. Blazing Ahead, but the trail actually crosses Skyline Drive 24 times in 108 miles. So it's, it's very much there. In other places, um, there were old fire towers that are still remnants of when the, when the um, squads used to have to go out into the field and look for fires from, from there. And, um, also, one of the stories I tell in the book is about how a 1908 uh, iron bridge was actually taken out of service, a road bridge in Pennsylvania, and repurposed to be a walking bridge on the Appalachian, which I think is really cool. It's a neat way to make sure that some of those old resources are repurposed and kept uh, in perpetuity. Kind of similar to rail trails and yes, so on. Yes, exactly. You have the cultural and natural next to each other. Exactly. There's a lot of books on the AT. How, do, how does your book differ? Um, I think it differs because it's a story of a friendship over a prolonged period. I think Wayne and I started out basically hardly knowing each other and then becoming like brothers over the years. And as I say, it's sort of like a Venn diagram. You have two people with very different personalities that overlapped a bit over the years. And that is an interesting aspect. And then how the food changed, the technology changed, um, all of that. Um, the path stayed the same. Everything else changed. <laughs> what were the most important technological changes? Well, we talked about years? film. I, I went all the way yeah. from slide film to sure. digital in the midst of, of creating the book. And you can actually see it in some of the old photos. But the food and the gear changed dramatically. Um, we went from uh, basically aluminum frame packs to carbon fiber packs. We went from, uh, an, in food, we went from Lipton one pot meals <laughs> from <those> aisle <laughs> six. Um, there was basically nothing else. And um, you know now you can make breakfast burritos, who knew? Yeah. <laughs> um, so we can have a lot more ethnic tight meals than we had at the beginning. <laughs> so you can walk down any health food store aisle and see 
um, vast varieties of food that we just didn't even have back in the cup of soup days. Hiking the trail with a friend obviously leads allusions to Bill Bryson's yes. <laughs> <laughs> book. Um, did you read it? Were you influenced by it? <laughs> I, I actually, it, it, it broke my mother's heart. She gave me the book and thought I'd be really interested in it, which I was. <laughs> but I told her I couldn't read it until after I wrote mine because I didn't Very want wise. something to infiltrate <laughs> Having read in. both, yours is quite different. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I, I, but I did read it after the fact, which I found very amusing. But it is interesting to spend that much time with a person. Um, you learn how to innately trust each other. It's like mm -hmm. being on a um, rock climb and being roped to somebody. You have to be with someone whose judgment you trust and who you trust to be honest with you about how they're feeling uh, physically and mentally because yeah. your trip depends on it too. And uh, that was an interesting aspect of it. Do most hikers, this raises a question, you see on the AT, are they hiking solo or are they hiking with a partner? A lot of people hike with a partner, but mo most people are finding out now that even if you start out solo, you don't stay that way for long. Um, particularly if you get on with the, the great group that kind of heads out of Georgia right. in March and April. Uh, you make friends while you're going, and everyone kind of keeps tabs on each other as you go. This was a little different because we were often out in the fall when there were hardly any people out, yeah. and it was just us. And you literally had the pick of the litter in terms of campsites and lean-tos, and <laughs> there weren't any bugs. Uh, the mosquitoes <laughs> right. were gone, and uh, you know we used to say no bugs and no tourists, <laughs> just us. So um, that was kind of a nice aspect of it. What do you think is a better way to experience the trail? Do a through hike or sections? Uh, both. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's really a treat to do a six month hike, and I, I would do it again in a second. Um, the self reliance aspects of it, the logistical parts, the just being away from everything for that length of time mm -hmm. is really a gift. Um, but then again, um, doing a section hike is is the same thing, only different. Um, you're, as I say in the book, it gave us an opportunity to really just delve into where we were at the particular time and treat yeah. each trip as a gift. When you're on a through hike, you tend to have this mentality of, I have to keep making progress. And I think that diminishes a little bit your ability to kind of enjoy what's totally happening in front of you. Because in the back of your mind is this, I need to make Canada by, before it snows. <laughs> Right. Um, so even on days off, what they call zero days, um, zero mileage days, it's hard. Uh, you keep thinking, boy, I better get up and really get some more miles tomorrow. Where you guys could so, just enjoy. Right. So we knew, <laughs> we knew, boy, if we do a big day tomorrow, we can have a short day the day after. And right. it's supposed to be going up over this mountain with great views. And we can relax and have a two-hour lunch. and or we can get somewhere early and watch the sun go down. And that part of it, I think, is really a great way of, a, a great aspect of section hiking. I've seen how you're researching now. <laughs> well, you're at NCTC, but it raises a question. You're writing a book about a hiking trail. Um, when you write a book like this, are you taking notes on the trail or are you doing a lot of your writing immediately after you get home while it's fresh? A little um, bit of both. I, well, most of it was written in the tent at night, uh -huh. which was also an interesting aspect. <laughs> do you have a coal of, miners? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> I do, actually, the <laughs> yeah, headlamp. Yeah. And uh, Wayne, being a man of few words and an introvert, would scratch down a few words and say, okay, you ready to make dinner yet? And I'd be, <laughs> you know, 20 pages later. Um, I didn't take many notes as I went during the day. I tend to have a photographic memory, so I remember when I look back through the, the um, guidebook of, oh yeah, when we got to the top, I saw a deer and, you know, that kind of thing. And um, so I did a really good job of recapping at the end of the day. But the one interesting exception was we got back from a trip and uh, it was actually, I'd finished the book and I sent it to the publisher and I woke up in the middle of the night three days late, three nights later and thought, oh my gosh, there's something tragically wrong with the book. So I ran to my computer and I found out that I had not submitted a chapter oh, no. of the, the writing part. I yeah. had submitted the photos and the maps. And I thought, what's wrong? And so I went to find my journal, which I found, 
And I opened it and I said, oh, I decided to take a break from writing on this trip. <laughs> <laughs> so I called Wayne in a complete panic and said, you don't happen to have any notes from this trip. And he called me back about an hour later and said, it's really funny. That's the only one I took really extensive notes. So I'll translate it from Wayne speak into um, uh, <laughs> something you'll remember. And, and it, was, it was just like that. Everything came back and I submitted the chapter and it came out pretty well actually so did you have a trail name I did um, I started as Trampus and because um, <laughs> I, I like to tramp around and uh, <laughs> there was a character on an old uh, TV show called the Virginian oh yeah when uh, his name was Trampus and I always liked that <laughs> name but Wayne didn't like that name so he he named me El Thumpius the mule <laughs> because I, I carry so much on my back so I, that kind of stuck why do people have trail names, do you think? I don't know where that originated, but um, it certainly caught on, and it's become really part and parcel of the whole AT experience. And if you don't have one within the first couple hundred miles, someone will give you one. <laughs> so, so you're better you, off you, picking you, your yeah, own. Yeah, you're better off picking your <laughs> own. Uh, one of my favorites was Dances with Flies. <laughs> <laughs> that <laughs> would there, work well in are, Maine. <laughs> yes. There are a number of gray beards, and, uh, you know, there are... Um, granola and you know you name it but they're pretty funny well there's all sorts of traditions for right. the AT uh, we alluded to one and your second book um, is quite a change of pace whereas Appalachian yes. Odyssey is is um, focused on the experience and, and I like the title Odyssey because it is an Odyssey mm -hmm. in the Homeric tradition um, but your second book is a straightforward history book which we we love here all right. <laughs> since I'm a historian and uh, what led you to this change of pace what, well, as I was writing Appalachian Odyssey, I really became uh, more and more appreciative of the fact that somebody came up with this idea and got it built. And as is often said, trails don't just happen. And um, the older I get, the more I appreciate the fact that somebody had the foresight to build this, this great resource in the first place. So I started digging into the urban legend of Benton Mackay and <laughs> Myron Avery, the doer and the dreamer, mm -hmm. um, and th actually the dreamer and the doer. And um, I started digging into it and finding out what made these guys tick, what made this idea even happen in the first place, and what made this really, truly obsessed guy grab onto the idea and push it through to reality. And uh, what a fascinating tale. The, the more I dug the more interesting it got. There's a lot of resources to tell you how to hike the AT, but how do you research the history of the AT? Where are these records kept? Well, it, um, actually, what's interesting is the uh, there's a very good Benton Mackay biography written by a man named Larry Anderson. Mm -hmm. And so I read that book, and I got, a, got the idea that a lot of his archival materials came from Dartmouth. And they have not only the Benton Mackay materials, but the whole Mackay family. So that was a really great resource for me. And then for Myron Avery, it was just a really fortuitous, uh, just kept digging and digging until I found the Maine State Archives oh. had 10,000 letters that Myron <laughs> Avery had written during the course of the building of the trail. And basically that resource alone led me to a lot of other things. but. That's so rich and, and so full that I was able to draw a lot of material from that. So when was the very first idea to have a, a trail along the Appalachians? The, the first idea came uh, to Benton Mackay. It started germinating as a child. He was 12 years old. He mm -hmm. lost his father. He was uh, devastated by that. And he started taking walks in the woods around his house in Massachusetts and exploring. So that was really the first kind of um, inkling that the outdoors had a restorative quality to it, uh, being in the outdoors. And then when in 1900, when he was a recent college graduate, or I, I guess he was a, about to be, he was a junior in college, between junior and senior year, he went for a hike in southern Vermont with a friend. Um, and they ended up going up above tree line in what ended up becoming both the Long Trail and part of the Appalachian Trail. So that also left a, a really big mark with him about the environment and being in the mountains. And so then uh, in 
1921, he lost his wife. His wife committed suicide, actually. It was very tragic. And he went to recoup from that at a friend's house in northern uh, New Jersey. And when he was there, he came up with this idea for this, at the time, 12-state super trail from Mount Mitchell to, uh, to uh, Mount Washington in New Hampshire. And as we know, it extended yeah, out from Katahdin, there into yeah. uh, Mount Katahdin in Maine and to uh, Springer Mountain in Georgia, originally Oglethorpe, mm -hmm. which was Avery's doing. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, the, the idea was put out in 1921, and it kind of bounced around for a few years with very little traction. And then in 1929, Avery grabbed the bull by the horns and in nine years basically built it himself. The two men, uh, Mackay and Avery, had very different backgrounds. So let's start with Mackay. What what was his training, and he, how did he tie into the early conservation movement yeah. in ways that were unknown to me? Um, Fascinating. So he, he grew up in a very uh, wealthy family. His grandfather was on the ground floor of J.P. Morgan Chase and okay. Wells Fargo, so they, there was no lack of money there. Um, but his father was a dreamer like mm -hmm. he was, and his father came up with a number of ideas about um, making, making vast amounts of money and then losing vaster amounts of money and he would do things like come up with ideas for um, bringing Buffalo Bill Cody to Broadway and <laughs> things that made scads of money and then he would lose it and his grandfather finally put a stop to that and said if you want to do stuff do it on your own dime so he did and he lost the family fortune um, again or his part of the family fortune and then he lost his life uh, to a big project that he had basically given his life to. And um, Mackay was left as a 12-year-old in the wake of all of this. And um, so he knew the restorative nature of the outdoors, and he came up with this idea for the trail. And at, as, a, as a young man, 12-year-old, uh, when they still had money, they were spending time in D.C., and he went to the Smithsonian and started drawing birds and reptiles. And uh, he would sit on a camp stool in front of the displays yeah. there as a 12-year-old boy. He was a really gifted artist. And finally, they realized that this little boy is here every day. Why not just give him access to all the materials in the back room? So he started drawing all these things. And he had a real appreciation for nature. And that's where his conservation ethic immediately came to the fore. So he started putting together ideas of ecosystems and uh, going out into the field and drawing plants and animals and entire ecosystems, reptiles, ponds, ferns, how everything interrelated. And he always had a mind that worked like that. Mm -hmm. How did things interrelate? So I think that directly led to this idea of this trail, which as he said it from the very beginning in 1921, should be a place where we should oxygenate and recreate and gain perspective. And for 1921, that was quite a thing to be saying. It's odd he drifted into forestry instead of art. Yes, <laughs> it is. Based on that background. It is. And actually, Especially at Harvard, which right, is a right. renowned for well, forestry. Well, it's funny how that happened because forestry mm -hmm. was mentioned to him by his father. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, well, what's forestry? And he said, well, you know, it's this. So he... he started looking into forestry and found out that Yale had a school, so he applied to Yale, and Yale actually said to him, well, why don't you go to Harvard? He said, well, I didn't know Harvard <laughs> had a school. That's good advice. <laughs> and uh, he said, they do now, and he yes. was the first student of wow. the um, Harvard Forestry School and then became an adjunct professor and then an assistant professor, and then he went into uh, forestry with uh, the Gifford Pinchot. Which is an amazing connection I knew nothing about. And I went to Harvard as a graduate student. I don't recall them having anything named after McKay. Right, right. <laughs> the, the Harvard Forest ought to be the McKay Forest right, or something right. to, to recognize him. That's, right. It's kind of shocking. Did his forestry inform his interest in the trail at all? Or? Oh, my gosh, yes. <laughs> and a actually, the other interesting aside for, from his uh, early years in Forest Service was his one of his first projects was being assigned to what became the White Mountain National yeah. Forest. So he was a field officer out there documenting what needed to be documented to prove that this should be one of the, the uh, Eastern National Forests. 
So he was involved in that. That was about 1908 and 1912-ish. And um, so that was very interesting. So again, the White Mountains <laughs> through which the Appalachian yes. Trail goes. So he was, um, it, it all informed it. But the thing that did him in with the Forest Service was he was a little bit too progressive for their ilk. And he came up with ideas that were structurally sound but had sort of uh, aspects to them that were a little uncomfortable for a little too uh, progressive for where the Forest Service wanted to be. So he ended up leaving the Forest Service, which led him into the Appalachian Trail movement. As you note, uh, his early vision of the AT had four components, two of which are pretty familiar to us. A trail, <laughs> which, which was a new idea at the time, and right. huts, which right. was a really good idea for those of us that have hiked sections of it. Uh, but his other two ideas were somewhat more avant-garde, and, and that involved community groups and the, the farm and food camps. Right. So you need to explain those a little more since they didn't yes. really come to fruition. Or, no, or he, he foresaw the opportunity. And, and one of the things, just to frame it, was he, he was living or, and growing up in an era where there was a great flight from rural to urban. Yes. And there was a genuine fear that people would leave the farms for good and there would be no economy out in the rural areas. And that was one of the reasons why he proposed the trail was to bring people from the city back out into the country. So he envisioned building these farm communities that were very sort of um, socialist uh, villages where people would get free room and board in exchange for um, working on the trail and helping um, put people up and feed them meals. And so what's ironic is that never really came to fruition but communities still very much um, benefit economically yeah. from the trail, the, the lodging and the uh, pizza places and, uh, you know, and the people that shuttle people to the trail have all benefited. Communities have, have very much benefited from having the trail in their backyard. So he was right. <laughs> and he was also right that people would be coming from the city yeah. to enjoy the trail. It was just not in the way that he envisioned. He didn't have to build the uh, farm community infrastructure to make that happen. Um, Henry Ford and the automobile <laughs> <laughs> helped, helped make people want to come to the country right. and gave them the means to do it. And that's and what then Ford built that. his own little farm village in that, that's Dearborn, right. that's too. Right. He had the money to do. That's what. right. <laughs> yeah, it's a fascinating thing. It's, it'd be interesting to imagine an AT with little farm communities right. all the way down right. it. Uh, it was a, a very interesting idea. Let's move on to Avery, because uh, as you mentioned, in a way, he's the doer to, to get the trail um, made. But before we jump to what he did with the trail, his background, total opposite. Total opposite. <laughs> opposite of what people probably even imagine, a, a, a pioneer with the AT. Tell us a little about his background. Well, Myron Avery grew up as far down east in Maine as you can get, almost into Canada, and a very rural, and still very rural, and... Um, and um, a fishing related community they mm -hmm. had at the time he grew up they had 12 sardine factories in, wow. in town and um, <laughs> his father was actually manager of one of the sardine plants and but he was Myron was absolutely a brilliant man even as a youngster and he got accepted into Bowdoin College the only problem was there was no money yeah. and the citizens of Lubeck passed a hat and raised enough money wow. to send him to school and so um, I believe that um, as we discover, Myron grows up with a bit of a chip on his shoulder. And I, I'm no psychologist, but I do believe that part of that was driven by the need to prove that uh, the people did right by putting their money behind him. But he was an exceptionally driven man. And uh, his first love was actually Katahdin, which was interesting for a kid growing up on the coast. He went inland and fell in love with Katahdin and started researching the history of the hikes around Katahdin, the trails around Katahdin, and that gave him his first entree into the sort of mountaineering and trail yeah. community, which ultimately led him to be tapped on the shoulder to build the AT, to lead the construction of the AT in 1929. And what did he do for a living, which is... Extraordinary. He was a, a full-time <laughs> lawyer, maritime, maritime lawyer, lawyer right? for, the, for the government, which makes 
<laughs> his accomplishments all that more impressive because all of the stuff that I'm about to talk about, that we're about to talk about, um, happened in the context of having a full-time job. So, and I couldn't see any place where being a lawyer <laughs> influenced this thought on the AT. Maybe, maybe you could see some connection, but it's almost like these two parts of his life were dichotomized. They, they were, <laughs> except for the fact when he was fighting for something, you could see his, <laughs> his lawyerly arguments coming out um, in spades. But he, he was um, incredibly driven. I, I really almost think he put Steve Jobs to shame, that he was absolutely driven to get this trail built. And um, I don't know if he knew that he was um, he was um, racing time in terms of his own longevity or not. Uh -huh. That's open to debate. But he was so driven, it's hard to know whether he um, he knew that he was going to have a short life or whether it was the other way around. But um, it, that working so hard did him in. But he walked the entire trail. He saw where all the trail signs should be. He measured the whole trail with a bicycle wheel that he took with him <laughs> right. every time he went out. He was the first 2,000 mile hiker. He wrote the guidebooks and he wrote all the publicity materials feeling that, oh my gosh, we're going to build this trail and no, no one's ever going to even know it exists. <laughs> um, no one's going to use it. So he was absolutely obsessed with every aspect of the trail. So how do you get brought into the, the construction of the AT? He was discovered by a guy named Judge Perkins. Arthur Perkins was a retired uh, Connecticut judge that briefly took over the job of getting the AT built when it wasn't really moving anywhere in 1928. And he thought, you know, I'm retired. I'm not really the one to do this, but boy, this upstart kid will make it happen. And gee, he was right. He was a good talent evaluator. So, um, yeah, he tapped Myron, and the rest is history. He really did it. A fair bit of the book is the challenges he has to physically construct the thing. What was his vision about how it would get built, since it wasn't a federal project, <clears throat> at least until the CCC got right. involved in Well, his, his vision was if you build it, they will come, and he really wanted to have the trail complete uh, regardless of the precise placement of it. Mm -hmm. He just saw the need to get this thing built. What I, what I think is really interesting and revealing about his personality is he knew that he was up against the Depression and yeah. the money challenges were enormous, particularly when he got to the 288 miles that went through Maine. And so what he did is he went to the owners of the hunting and fishing camps and said, gee, there's great fishing early in the spring and there's great hunting in the fall, but you've got this bridge season with nobody here. What if hikers came through and spent the night and, and had meals with you and spent money? And every one of them said, that sounds great, sign me up. So that's how he got the trail built in Maine in, in incredibly short speed. Yeah, you, you give some concrete examples of them running out of money for paint for the yeah. signs and so yeah. on. I mean, money was insanely tight. <laughs> money was insanely tight, and it also gives us an appreciation for uh, a bucket of paint was $2 or $3 right. back then, and they could not find the money. Yeah. And he would beg and cajole and shame people into giving him what he needed, and he was unabashed about it. He would just keep pushing until he got what he needed, and... You have to give him all the credit for, for pushing through and getting it done. How did he map it out? I mean, how was the, the actual trail itself? He went and did it. He found, <laughs> um, he went himself, and he had a pretty good idea. He, was a, he wasn't a cartographer, but he was really good with maps, and he saw where he thought the trail should go, and then he would grab a couple people and head out of D.C., and jump on to part of the Shenandoahs and, you know, wherever. I, I need to go from here to here, what's going on this mountain range. And they would literally blaze the path and um, cut it. And in many cases, they'd put the paint blazes on right then and there so they'd remember where it was. And then they'd come back later and, and, and trim it out and start walking it and make it a real trail. Now, by the 1930s, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot of public domain land <laughs> east right. of the Mississippi or even right. 
federal land. Um, so how did they uh, acquire the rights to <laughs> build well, a trail right across New England, the Mid-Atlantic, and the Southeast? Yeah, that's what they, <laughs> well, they actually just basically, they tried to use as much public land as yeah, possible. Yeah, it goes through a lot of state parks. And there were a lot of it. state parks yeah. that they utilized. That was most of it. And then, as I said, when they when they had those bridge areas, they just figured it out. And in a lot of cases, uh, particularly in New England, there were old logging roads uh -huh. that they were able to jump onto, and they figured it will establish the trail first. If we need to move it later, we will. But that's what they would do. So they'd get big sections accomplished that way. Um, even in state forests where logging and fire roads existed, they'd say, "Okay, we're going to hop on here and that's go fast. for a I've couple miles." I've always wondered about that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it, was this all? Yeah, you know, parkland. It wasn't all bushwhacking <laughs> yeah. by any means, but they but they figured it out and. Another really interesting character, I think, in the book is this guy named Walter Green, who was a Broadway actor. He yeah. had 17 shows on Broadway that he was in, but he spent most of his, day, um, his years on a lake in Maine, and Avery literally ran into him in the middle of nowhere, north of Katahdin, in the middle of the woods. They were both bushwhacking to go out and explore, and they literally had a Dr. Livingston moment yeah. in the middle of the woods. What are you doing here? And um, Avery told Green that he was building this great trail, and Green laughed and said, I know every inch of woods mm -hmm. from Katahdin to Monson, which is now known as the 100-mile wilderness. Yeah. And Green basically told him where to put the trail. So they worked with foresters on some of it, but very famously, um, at age 64, um, Walter Green grabbed an ax and blazed the trail over the top of the barren Chairback mountain range in Maine by himself. And uh, it, it's still an amazing feat when you hike over that and think, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm starting to approach that and thinking, <laughs> man, how did this guy just, and he, and he always, he had a funny way, he carried a pack with what they call the trump line, which was a headband that went down to the pack. And he would just carry these enormous loads of axes and saws and paint cans and everything else. and He'd write a letter back to Avery and say, okay, that trail's done now. And, and there's uh, a lot of personalities in the book that yes. built this, since it wasn't just done as a, a large-scale federal project. But Avery has a particular personality that comes out. Tell us a little about his prickly personality. Prickly is the word, <laughs> or, or acerbic. He uh, would not take no for an answer. His letters are so astounding to read that in many cases I put big chunks of them in there be in the book because... It really gives you an idea for how he thought. But he was not afraid of making enemies. Um, he alienated one, one map publisher wrote to him at one point and said, you've done it now, you've alienated the entire publishing world. Um, <laughs> so he, and he fought with editors. He really had this vision of how he thought things should be and would not suffer fools. He just wanted this thing built, and that's full steam ahead was his only speed. Blazing ahead indeed. <laughs> yeah, it's a good title. So Pinchot and Muir had Hetch Hetchy Valley as their big controversy. It seems to me in your book, perhaps the culminating controversy is ironically in one of the more well-traveled parts of the AT. And, and what's now Shenandoah National Park and, and Skyline Drive. Tell us about that controversy. Skyline Drive was the wedge that drove Avery and Mackay apart. And um, it was quite stunning, actually. They, the Appalachian Trail community had what they thought was a reliable mole inside the workings of the um, Shenandoah Park Commission. And they were relying on him to feed back information that related to the trail coming from Shenandoah. What they didn't know is that everyone else on the commission knew that the guy was a mole, so they kept him out of the loop, and 29 miles of Skyline Drive were pretty much staked out and built before the rest of the uh, AT community understood what was going on. So very famously, Mackay Avery and a fellow named Harold Anderson from Potomac Appalachian Trail Club went up to see what was going on and they were stunned to see a road built over their trail and they didn't know 
they discussed what to do about it. Makai was mortified because here was a guy who wanted the trail to be a place to get away from right. man-made things and to recreate and oxygenate, as he put it. And Avery's response was, well, we'll just get the Park Service to move the trail on. It's not that big a deal. And uh, Mackay was, as I said, mortified. And that really started a falling out, a, a formal falling out between them that took a couple years to culminate. But by the end of it, Avery had commandeered control of uh, Appalachian Trail Conservancy and the community and basically pushed Mackay and uh, his followers out. Did the Park Service really move the trail? Because it still they seems that, so they just put it they parallel moved it. to S Skyline Drive? Well, <laughs> they, they sort of had to. Mm -hmm. um, one, of the, one of the interesting parts about Shenandoah National Park is uh, when they built the park, they originally had envisioned it being three times its size hmm. and predominantly that. wider. Um, but in Virginia's efforts to reclaim the land, in other words, buy it from people who were already living there, they were falling short and they kept falling shorter and shorter. So finally the government said we can only accept this final smallest offer. But that's why if you look at a map of it, it's very, very narrow. Yeah. And so when, when the road got built, there wasn't really in a lot of places, there weren't really many options to move it aside very far. I think the furthest the trail gets from Skyline is two miles. So it's constantly in its shadow. But in order for the trail to stay in the park, that's what they had to do. And yet it's become perhaps the most accessible part of the trail. <laughs> 24 crossings and 108 miles. It's yeah. really, it, it's the juxtaposition to the 100 mile wilderness where in Maine where there's one dirt road crossing in 100 miles. So you have both extremes on the same long distance trail. Why do you think Avery's largely forgotten, and, and Mackay is still remembered, not as much as a mirror or, or Pinchot even, but. Well, two things. I think Mackay is, is the originator of the idea, so that certainly helps. I think Myron's personality actually pushed people away, even, even historians. Um, no one had <laughs> Except even, you. <laughs> yeah, no one had wanted to touch him um, uh, in a biographical sense. Um, and there was still a lot of controversy and still to this day within the trail community about his attitude and um, his personality. And, uh, and uh, conversely, I, I found it fascinating. I thought um, when I started, I was upset at some of the ways he was writing. Um, I felt that um, he was not honoring the people at the other ends of the communications <laughs> as much as he might. But um, what I came to realize is perhaps, and, and even more than perhaps, likely the trail would never have been completed unless it had that driving personality pushing it all the way to the end. That segues to my final question about this book is, um, are there lessons to be learned from, from this tension between Mackay and Avery and, and the, the history behind the AT? I think there are. Um, I, I think that um, for me, um, I agree that the personality of Avery was needed to the extent that we needed someone who would persevere. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we needed someone with um, that pointed an attitude. Um, he did have friends, to be sure, but they were few. And um, Avery was more, or, or Mackay rather, was more of a well-known um, had a lot of friends within government and, and, and private life as well, but didn't have the ability to project manage. So I think it really took, it took both. And I, I think it's rare to find a single person with both aspects. So for me, the lesson for both of them is take the best of both, put them together, and you can get anything done. I think that's a great way to go out, Jeff, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with a, a, a charge. Uh, it's, this has been a real pleasure. And the two books, once again, are Appalachian Odyssey and Blazing Ahead. And Jeff, we look very much forward to your future projects and, and working with you uh, again. Thank great. You. Thanks for having me. It's been wonderful.